Well, it is my privilege and an honor and a delight to be able to interview today um, one of the leading worship leaders of our time, uh, uh, Jeremy, who I know that you uh, have been working for some time. I'll ask you more yeah. details because I don't know the details, totally. but at, at Bethel, which yeah. is a place I love, yeah. love Bill, yes. love, love the culture, yes. just love what's coming out of there. And uh, and prior to that, you were involved in heavily in the writing music and yeah. worship and involved with the vineyard movement. Sure. And um, and I, I think I read something that said that uh, you began to get exposed to um, vineyard at 13 years old. Yeah. And I think what I read, you you quoted John Wimber, yeah. who said it's more caught than taught. It's true. So, you know, you have such a rich heritage. Could could you um, just kind of tell us a little bit about your pilgrimage? Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm curious to know uh, in what way and how did God uh, lead you to go back now mm-hmm. and to become the worship leader yeah. at the Anaheim Vineyard? Yeah. Um, well, it's quite a story. Um, I'll try and make it simple and, and to the point. Um, but yeah, just a little bit about our journey, my family's journey. It's impossible for me to talk about my journey without talking about my parents who were saved in the Jesus movement. And um, the Lord just woke something up in their hearts. And um, they had a really stable life. Like my first, my first uh, years, probably about 12 years old, my dad was a practicing attorney. And they had a large number of kids, seven altogether. I was the second born, and uh, we went to a First Baptist church, you know, and life was was very, very normal. But something was a hunger, an appetite was was um, born in them when they were radically, radically saved in the Jesus movement. And um, so they're always on a pilgrimage, always looking for the more of God, you know, always looking for where that was. And that led them to join YWAM for a period of time which is honestly where the first seeds were sown in my heart. It was my first exposure to like contemporary worship or that kind of thing was watching this amazing worship leader named Bob Fitz and, and something yeah. went off in my heart. And, and what and, year uh, would that have been? That's, um, gosh, I was 12. So that would have been like 1989, 88, 89, something like that. Yeah. So, um, so we spent a, a, a uh, probably a total of a year at the, at the base, the big base, the Y1 base on Kona in Kona, Hawaii. And um, my dad, though, is just always a worshiper, um, always hungry to find. He just had a he had a he had a nose to find out where the worship movements were happening, and and uh, he began to listen to this guy named Kevin Prosh, who was at the Anaheim Vineyard um, at the time, and we had relocated to Southern California, and we were just kind of in a search, you know, at that point in time. But ultimately, my dad, we began to make an hour long commute to the vineyard, um, and uh, that's when I was I was about thirteen years old. And something just happened to me there. It was like the Lord, it was the soil that the Lord was, you know, planted me in in that season. I remember just being 13 years old and going up to the front and oh, it was just something happened in worship. I was just drawn to worship. And you know, you don't have the articulation at that age. You don't understand what's happening to you. You don't know any of that, but you're being formed. And I was being formed in a house of worship with all these and everyone who was who was kind of a rising name in worship was coming through that house, and and um, I got a front row seat to one of the most significant worship movements, you know, um, you know of our of our time. So super super grateful. But um, but yeah, now I look back and I see exactly what John meant when he said more is caught than taught, um, because it wasn't through a lecture, it wasn't through you know a seven course teachings of you know this is what worship is. It was being immersed in a culture of worship with the people that poured out their hearts to the Lord that um, weren't doing this for performance or platform, but they would wear their hearts on their sleeves and they would just pour out their hearts. And there was such um, these holy moments of divine connection with the Lord. And that just forms you, it shapes you. And so what began to come out of me was just what I saw come out of others. I don't know, it's just a wild, wild journey. Who, so. who were some of those uh, main worship leaders that at, at the Anaheim at the time? Uh, was oh, was Eddie? Eddie Espinosa was uh-huh. still there. He was, uh, he was amazing. Um, 
Uh, Andy Park was a significant mm -hmm. guy there at the time too. Brian Dirksen, mm -hmm. um, mostly coming as a visitor, but he was frequent. Um, David Ruiz was always coming down, just wild, full of the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, gosh, Kevin Prosh was still there for I think two, three years while while I was still there. Um, uh, Rita Springer would come through from time to time. Um, I was at that recording where she sang "Make Us a Prayer" and just tore the the roof off. Um, was, I'm just trying to think ben, about Danny all the Daniels other. Was there. Danny Daniels was there. Um, oh gosh, who else was there at the time? Um, Daphne Rademacher, uh, Cindy Rethmeyer. Uh, well, let me ask you a quite yeah. personal question. Yeah, do that. It's uh, uh, personal to me anyway. Yeah. How would you characterize this time frame hmm. when you were being formed? What was the what? How would you characterize the atmosphere, the, the culture, the, the visitation? Was the vineyard at that moment, that season of time, was it in a, a time of, well, I guess use the term revival, hmm. visitation? Hmm. I think um, in many ways, yes. But, but you know, John, John, there was never any hype. If anything, he would work to um, de-escalate hype and mm -hmm. and any kind of emotionalism that that you know that um, often kind of accompanies that. Um, I I think it was a moment where the services were characterized by by again like a profound. Um, move of the Spirit, but it was a people who were simply being present to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. It was, um, and in some ways, you, you showed up, um, there, was, there was a sense, it was a heavy, weighty sense, and again, I was so young, so, you know, these are like almost foggy memories, but I remember the very first time we walked in, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't at the building that it is now, it was in, actually in Cerritos, it was at this old kind of, what is now a flea market, but there was this massive building, and I remember walking Warehouse. in. Yeah. I was there. Yeah, <laughs> as a 12-year-old boy. And I remember feeling the sense of reverence, like a sense of awe in the room. And I've been walking into churches for you know most of my life, and I've never felt that. And it was just weighty. It was the weight of his presence. And so that was that was definitely something that was um, not unusual, I guess, but but distinct, you know. And um, but you never knew what was going to happen because it was it was. John, you never knew what was going to happen in worship. You never knew who was going to. And that was, you know, back in the day when people would stand up and give words and, you know, speak in tongues and all of that. It was just, the air was pregnant with possibility. And, um, but I think that atmosphere was intentional. Like, and I don't think it was necessary. I wouldn't even call that revival or even renewal so much as what, what I, I believe to be the way that we, ought, the way as the church should function when we come together, that there is that dynamic. John used to say that worship was always intended to be a two-way street. It was never intended to be just this one-way vertical thing where we send up our praises to heaven and then we go on with our day, that there was meant to be this interaction mm -hmm. from heaven. And that changes everything. Like right. when we do something as simple as just open up a space for God to be God, and we're listening and we're seeking, we're attempting to discern how he's moving and what he's speaking. And, and um, we empower leadership and we grow leadership who are able to recognize how the spirit's moving and they're able to call that out. That changes everything. It electrifies things, you, you know? So I don't know if you wanna call that revival so much as um, I think the church being the church and allowing the Holy Spirit to lead and orchestrate. You know, that's what it was. That was what stuck with me, mm -hmm. you know? And the same thing I saw at Bethel, honestly. So, so when did you go? Did you go straight from Anaheim to Bethel, or was there a circuitous route? No, they, 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 there was a route. Yeah, I don't think I could have handled honestly Bethel um, coming where I was coming um, uh, from Anaheim and um, the journey. I think the Lord knew I needed a detox period. So um, you know we. We moved up to a small little county called Lake County um, to be with my parents. And originally we were gonna plant a church and that never materialized. Um, but, um, but I realized that the Lord had drawn me out to a wilderness and, and to get a hold of my heart again. And, um, so, and it was a season of realizing that in all my zeal and spiritual fire to see the Lord, that there was a lot of stuff that needed to happen in my heart. And, um, and the, Lord, uh, the Lord just began to, to move and to break things down 
in me. It was a humbling season. Um, but I'm so grateful because it created a real appetite and hunger for me. It was like a two-year period. And by the end of that two-year period, I'm like, Lord, I just have to find more of you. Like I have to find like where you're moving and you know, where, where is this, this people that my heart has longed to join? And I just began to kind of scour the earth and every church that I attended and led worship at, I was just like, Lord, is this where you're drawing? Where are you drawing us? And um, we'd heard of Bethel and, um, and we, you know, honestly, we didn't know. I was a little skeptical of it, you know. <laughs> Um, and uh, yeah, so we decided to visit for a weekend and that weekend changed our life. And I didn't, you know, honestly, I didn't, it wasn't about, I didn't know hardly anything about the culture or the church. I just knew that when we walked into that sanctuary and they began to worship that my heart was undone. And I felt that exact same thing that I felt like in, in the early Anaheim days. And I was like, I don't know what this is, but I know that I can't live without it. And I know that, that I will not become whoever I'm made to become in God without being formed here, you know? And so, um, and then we just moved everything up. And, and anyway, it's a crazy story after that, but it's a long one. So, so you were there how long? So I was there almost 10 years. Almost 10 years. Yeah. So I was there. I came just... You're 10 um, very good years to be at Bethel. <laughs> <laughs> really significant years. <laughs> this is before Bethel Music had come onto the scene. It didn't exist. Uh, it was, a, it was but, a, but a twinkle in Brian Johnson's eye and, you know, in his heart. Of, and, um, and yeah, it was just a wild, wild time. The environment was just so charged, so full. And it lifted worship out of you. It pulled worship out of you. And um, honestly, I, I don't think I grew more as a worship leader in any other season of life than I did my first two years at Bethel, um, particularly in learning how to follow the Holy Spirit. But that was very much because of a senior leader who, who gave such tremendous permission for, for those who, who got on that stage to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. No. I've never known anyone like Bill and how, how, how he did that, you know. It was almost he was impervious to what was, what was happening in, in the congregation, whether, they, whether or not they understood what was going on or not. I remember being in worship sets where we're an hour and a half deep. I'm exhausted. The band's exhausted. The songs are gone. My voice is gone. But you could feel that the Lord was doing something. And I would look out being just waiting for like, when's the person going to come up and, and end this thing, you know? And, and I would look down and, and much to my dismay at the time as you just, Bill, Bill would just be like, and I'm like, oh, this is not ending anytime soon. <laughs> this is the, and um, it was a rewiring and an understanding of, of, and it was such tremendous permission. And after a while, instead of being discouraged, when I would look out and see half the room sitting down, I'd be like, ah, oh, but that man, like he sees something. And it would give me the courage to, you know, and the whole team to just press into the deeper things of God. And always what would break out in those moments was just crazy. Such a, such a, such an amazing song, a time and the songs that flowed and yeah, remarkable, remarkable time. So. I don't know if I can focus that. <laughs> well, I have this theory, and it's just a theory, and you don't have to agree with it at all. But it seems to me, in my exposure, yeah, you know, I, I you grew up Baptist. I grew up Baptist. At least you were Baptist till thirteen. Yeah. I, was, I was Baptist till eighteen. <laughs> no, actually, uh, thirty-two when wow. Blaine from the Vineyard came to my Baptist church, and then wow. changes came. But one of the things I always was intrigued by with no teaching and no modeling, actually, for those first 32 years, was why is it that certain songs that we would sing, even in the Baptist church, you'd feel His presence and you get choked up and tears in your eyes. And other songs didn't do that at all. Wow. And, I, and, and so for me, my exposure to Vineyard was not only being taken by the theology, the balance in the theology toward a good understanding of the gifts in the kingdom. Huh. But the other thing that really captured me at 32 years old and having been preaching since I was 18 was the worship. Yeah. Uh, when they came in and, uh, you know, just had the little guitar and huh. started singing those songs, huh. uh, just like you promised, you know, yeah. you've come. I was done. And I was jealous. I was mad at Blaine in the first two songs when they first got there. 
because he just got out, knelt on the front row, lift his hands up like this and was just worshiping. And I think, what's he doing? Why is he doing that? Does he know we don't do that? <laughs> and I was upset with him. But by the third song, I was jealous wow. of the freedom. <laughs> and as I started listening to the songs, it, they just so, you know, so touched me. So, and I remember it was so foreign to us because I'm from the Midwest. We were one of the first vineyards in the Midwest. Wow. Um, but it was this, wow, there's something different, different approach. And then I, I got this little th one or two set cas cassette tape mm -hmm. teaching by Wimber mm -hmm. about worship. And it was about the atmosphere, about the not cheerleading, yeah. not just take the, go there yourself and take yeah. the people with you. Yeah. And I gave it to my song leader who became a worship leader. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. There's a transition. There, there was a transition from yeah. leading songs to leading <laughs> worship. worship. And it was such a beautiful time of being touched, the worship. So here, back to where I chased a little rabbit there, but where I started to say is, Seems to me that wherever the greatest songs are being written, it seems to have the most anointing and power and touching the most people. It, it's coming out of a place where there is, if I don't use the word revival, let me use the word a sense of visitation and presence yeah. in that congregation yeah. and among that people. Yeah. And you can almost tell where the movement or local church was at by the songs that came out during that season. You could actually see seasons. And wow. I, I remember right before 94, there was another season of these songs that began to come out. Yeah. And around 93, 94, it was almost like we were singing the visitation, come visit us. And yeah. So I, I just really feel that there is, people want to know, how do you write this kind of hmm. songs, music that, that captures the hearts of the world? Uh, I don't think there's a formula other than the, the writer's hearts have been captured first. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, this is something deep because, you know, songs are... Songs, writers, leaders. Um, I, I find that they're they're never kind of self-made. Like they're not they're not these isolated things that 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 come into being just out of someone's. Sometimes, sometimes there's always an exception to this that where they come out of just someone's personal experience and encounter, and the Lord gives weight to that and 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 kind of there's favor on it and it it, it travels the earth. But most of the time I see songs, they're birthed in a culture, they're birthed in a greenhouse, they're, they're, they're birthed in an environment, and those leaders that those songs come from, they're, they're not self-grown or self-made either. They're, they're, they're grown in that greenhouse. And, and I think I spent a lot of time studying like, what, what is that culture, what is that greenhouse, what are those, those ingredients that grow those kinds of leaders, that grow those, those, those kinds of songs? And, and the thing is, is when I, um, and I, I would say there's deep similarities between Bethel and, and Vineyard. It, it was like, but both the worship, our programs can become so cluttered with so many agendas that the heart gets buried, like the heart gets um, covered up. The, the wellspring of life gets covered up when the heart, you know, gets diminished. And I and I, I I feel like what Vineyard did is it just kind of moved all these other things. Like this is our job is not to to be cheerleaders. Our job is to not try and drum up any kind of thing. Our job is to come before the Lord to to connect with His heart and to lead people. And it's just so interesting. When I came to Bethel, like I, I it was a different language, but 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 the same kind of heart. It's like our goal, our agenda. The pre, like th this is this is the 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 dominant, like there is no no competitive agenda with this. It it is about his presence, like and at the time it wasn't known for its songs or anything. It was a people who would simply prioritize his presence over anything, and you know Bill taught his leaderships like if you were in a 
if you were in a holy moment, if there was any sense of the Lord doing it, like there was such a reverence for that, for that moment. Like, and he trained a, a group of people to know how to steward that. Like that's the whole hosting his presence, which is just recognizing when God is moving, when he's present, when he's manifesting his glory and understanding why and knowing how to partner with that and not quench it, but to see it, you know, released. But it's just moving, it's decluttering the thing and, and restoring the heart. And, and I go like, man, when you restore the heart of this thing and, and you say, we are here to minister to the heart of God, this is, this is our number one primary responsibility when we come together, it's amazing the environment that that creates. And then out of that environment, out of that soil, because it's soil really, and when you teach, when you raise up a people, it's, it's not just a stage, it's not just leaders. I think when I first came to Bethel, the thing that just captivated me was the people. Like, the leaders weren't even that great, to be totally honest. It wasn't like, oh, wow, look at these amazing, impressive leaders. They were grown later. But I, I just studied the people. They just, like, the worship leader could be incompetent, and that room was going there. Like, it was almost moving that team where their hearts were already there. And I was like, where did you come from? Who trained you? <laughs> like, how did you come into being? And then I watched Bill as he was... Bill's an architect, you know, when it comes to creating a people who know how to wait on the Lord and press into his presence. And, and that, it was that people that grew those leaders. It was that environment that grew those leaders and ultimately birthed those songs. And so, you know, on this journey that, that we're at again, like, I feel like, Lord, I, I want the keys that build, that, that reestablish the foundation. I want to see the tabernacle, the thing of worship, your people, a heart of worship restored and protected um, in the earth and so that it might have its full impact, that its purity um, and its power would, 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 yeah, do the thing that it was made to do. So, you know, I've been studying that and um, kind of giving myself, and I feel, still feel very much like a student, you know, but, um, but I do know that, that it's, it's as simple as coming back to the heart every single time. Like it's not, there's nothing complicated about worship. You know, it's why that, that story of that woman that, that just had to let Jesus know that, that sacrificed dignity, that sacrificed everything to get to the feet of Jesus, to, 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 to wipe her, wipe his feet with her, with her hair and with her tears. Like, like I have to let, you know, even if the whole room is disgusted by what's happening, if the whole room is checked out and they don't understand, like, I have to let you know, Jesus, what you've done for me and how you've moved, like, on my life. I just think, Oh, there's so much there, Randy, but, but I think that's the, you know, if there's one thing I, I feel like I'm supposed to kind of champion and, and guard and protect the earth, it's the purity of worship, and it's always just going to be about the heart, you know? Anyway. Jeremy, how, how old are you? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm coming up on my 42nd year here. And married and children. They married, five kids. How old are your children? Uh, 17 to 7. And everything in between. Yeah. Now, you are, as I said in the introduction, uh, have you already returned to Anaheim yet or on you? Yeah, we've been there um, a year and three months. A year and three like months. That. Yeah. And can, <laughs> what about, how did the Lord call you back there? Yeah. Because, I mean, you were, <laughs> you were really in a good spot yeah. in a very prominent yes. church at the yes. time. Yeah. And uh, how, did it, how did the Lord lead you back? <laughs> you and, know, and not only that, but for what was the purpose that, yeah. that he gave you? Yeah. We're still discovering, uh, I think, the, the purpose. And, uh, you know, it's funny how the Lord leads you. I, I had a friend of mine describe it um, like this, that sometimes the Lord... We'll, we'll, we'll dangle a carrot. I don't like this imagery all, all the way, but just bear with me. But he'll kind of dangle a carrot to get you off the couch. And then once you're moving, he'll, <laughs> he'll kind of swing you to the left, you know, or swing you to the right, you know. He's just trying to like first, like get you to take those first few steps. Um, but honestly, the prophetic was super instrumental, you know, in this. It was uh, probably a five-year process altogether. Um, because we were, when we came to Reading, and came to Bethel, we were just like, this is it. We're going to live here. We're going to die here. This is, we have found our people. We've found, you know, our place of belonging. This is, this is it for us. And so I think the Lord, the Lord just, he, he, he knows us so well, works with our hearts. So he just began to sow seeds. Not that we needed to do anything with the seeds, 
but but he's just like his way of just kind of going, hey, there's 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 something coming, you know, for you. And it was 2013. Um, we had a prophetic word about there being a return to Southern California and that it having to do something with our kids. And um, so in my head, I immediately built an, like a, an interpretive lens for that of going like, well, we're not moving back to Southern California. Apparently we'll be visiting a lot, doing a lot of commuting and maybe our kids will, will eventually kind of take up residence there again. And, and um, but we just, I could not even bring my heart to, to even think about moving back, you know. Um, we had just finished building our house in Reading, and so. Um, but, but, and then it just kind of was forgotten, kind of buried, not anything. I, I took too, mi- too much time kind of studying, and then two years later, I got another really significant word alluding to a transition, and the kind where I was just like, Lord, I, like, this is very disruptive from the track that we were on. And, um, and I got to process that, ironically, with Alan and Catherine Scott, one of the very first people I got to process that with. And they just gave me these words, I'll never forget it. And they just said, hey, you don't need to worry about that. When the time comes, you'll know. And, um, and you were was, processing that with them in yeah. Northern Ireland? Yes, I was in Northern Ireland That's at their where, church, where they before, at their church before they moved to Orange County. It was at their church. They just brought me in for their encounter, more conference. and. Um, and I got this really, really significant word from one of the prophetic people that was coming in. And, um, and, um, and I was like, guys, I don't know what to do with this. And they're like, you don't, you don't need to. Like, it'll, it'll, when the time comes, you'll, you'll, you'll know. And so, um, but, um, and then that rumble, like, you know, when you're transitioning, it's, it's almost like if you ever watched, you know, a few husbands out there that have watched your, your wife go through that, that journey in labor. It's like there just comes a time where you're like these little contractions, it's not that big of a deal. You're able to carry on with life as normal. And all of a sudden it hits a point where it's like it requires focus and attention. And, um, and it hit that point. And I didn't know where it was leading. I didn't know if it was even a geographic move or shift, but I had the process with leadership at that time and just say, hey, I'm in transition. And I don't know what that, what that means or what that looks like. I just know that 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 something there's a rumble that that I'm not able to quiet you know anymore and so um, at the time and this crazy thing I was making a record down in LA and I was I spent a lot of time and I was just running you know as I try and run I'm a terrible runner but I, I do it because I hear the Lord <laughs> when I run and um, keeps me healthy to some degree and I was running through the hills of Los Angeles and I would I began to feel the burden of His heart for Southern California again and. Um, and it was just weighty. It was weighty on me. And, um, and so originally we thought it was L.A. And we're like, we're okay. We feel like God's like moving us to L.A. And then, and then it's so funny. That's like the whole the thing. We're like, we're moving in a direction. And all of a sudden we're like, wow, looked at houses for three months, nothing. And, uh, and, um, and, um, it was, and then it was like Orange County. I'm like, babe, is this crazy that I'm thinking about Orange County? I, my wife is, I don't know how many people's marriages work like this, but my wife is very much like, I'll kind of submit ideas and, and she's the one that goes, this or no, not, not so much this. She's, she has a real sensitivity in, in that way. And she, I said, hey, is this crazy that I'm thinking about Orange County again? And, um, and she's like, no, I, I, I feel that too. You know, and at the time we weren't thinking about going back to Anaheim. It wasn't. It wasn't on our. It wasn't on our radar. And then we we got we got a, a text from a friend that basically told us they said, "Hey, Alan and Catherine Scott just took over the Anaheim Vineyard," and we were like, "Are you kidding? Like that's unheard of. Like, are, like do, do they? You know, we were just so shocked by that. So we called them up and said, "Hey, tell us. We got to hear the God story on this." And um, because they came to Orange County too, not like not looking to take over the NI Vineyard, just knowing that the Lord was pulling them to Southern California. So we got together, we had this beautiful kind of hilarious conversation and, and uh, where we told them and said, hey guys, we're actually moving back down to Southern California as well. And they're like, oh my goodness. Like, I'm like, 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 do you know what God's doing? And we're like, no, we were hoping you could tell us what God was doing, like one of those moments. <laughs> and, um, and, um, and, at the, and again, at the same time, we're just like, Anaheim wasn't the focus. This has been such an interesting journey for us where first it was the nations and we're like, the Lord's calling us to the nations. And then it's the region of Southern California. And then we're back at Anaheim and wondering why we're back at Anaheim and we're watching these two beautiful people just kind of slug it out, you know? Um, 
uh, you know, just week in and week out, you know, and, um, and then, and then, and all of a sudden we're like, wow, we're supposed to join. Like, this is why we're here. And the Lord has just kind of done this with our focus. And it's not because it's not for the region. It's not because it's not for the nations, but we've just realized, wow, he, he is restoring something and rebuilding something in this house that, that the story that began here is, is not a story that's over. It's a story that's still meant to grow and, and, and uh, touch the earth. And it's, it's less about the vineyard. It's less about uh, the names that we create and attach to movements. It, it's, it, it's, about, um, it's about the kingdom and it's about the heart of worship. And so honestly, Randy, I, I think every week is a, a week where we get greater revelation into what the Lord wants to do. But um, hmm. anyway, I got lost in my own story there. I wish I <laughs> could speak to a bit more of those kind of specific, you know, vision points. Well, let me ask you, in the midst of this transition, it's been, you've been now back a little over a year. Yeah. Uh, is there a correlation between things you're going through personally or the corporate worships going through that ends up becoming part of songs? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, hmm. Hmm. I think songs, it's an interesting time, I think, in the world of worship. Right now, there's a lot of testing um, going on in the world of worship. Um, I think everyone understands its importance, its power, um, and, and the attraction around it. Um, it's also like we're living in a day and an age in worship that we've never, we've never been here before, you know, um, particularly for worship leaders. And I, I think the battle over worship movements, the battle, the warfare of a worship is quite intense. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, honestly, I've never known a, a, a better time in history to be a worship leader for all the wrong reasons <laughs> than, than, than the one that we're in now. There's, there's a real fight over purity. There's a real fight over professionalism. And, and um, never in any other time in history could someone become a celebrity, um, make a, 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 an incredible living or any of these things off of, off, of, um, off of worship. You know, it's just such a fascinating time. And there's so much beautiful things that have happened, so much freedom, so much growth in the area of worship. But but I, but I feel that warfare now more than ever. And I feel we need houses that protect the heart of worship um, more than ever. We, we need those greenhouses um, that, um, that help leaders navigate. Um, and honestly, I, I would say when it comes to the worship movement, there, there are, there are two, two movements that... Um, give me a lot of hope for, for what I see is happening. Um, uh, and one is the prayer movement, and one is the missions movement. And I feel like there's a sound of worship that's going to begin to flow um, out, of, out, of those, out of the people of God that give themselves to prayer and give themselves to mission. And when I mean mission, I, I, I mean both compassion, uh, ministry to the lost and, 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 and the least. And you know what's funny is there's so much, again, attention given to to the fruit of what happens of worship, but but it's the it's 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 the soil that that we really need to protect. And you know what most people don't like, just as huge of a pillar at Anaheim was its compassion, was its ministry of compassion, was its ministry to the poor, and was its evangelistic focus. You know, it's like it was really birthed by evangelists and people that that were out proclaiming the gospel. And, and when I look at the prayer movement and I look at the missions movement, I look at what God's doing, rebirthing in YWAM, you know, and I look at the song that's beginning to flow out of that. And I look at the prayer movement and I see these, these, these two things that I think are going to really help refocus the worship movement and refine the worship movement. Because the missions movement that like it is, 
it's sacrificial, it's, it's, it's law-centered, it's, it, it's not caught up in, in, in a church game. Like it's, it's eyes on the harvest, it's eyes, it's, it's like in the fields with the Lord, you know? Um, and then you have the, the prayer movement, which is really just focused on ministry to the Lord, the, the primary importance of ministry to the Lord. And I'm watching these houses of prayer and these houses of mission kind of coming together. And I, I think there's a beautiful marriage of what the Lord is, is, is beginning to form. And I, I think, so these are, these are new things for, for Anaheim, but I feel like what the Lord is beginning to do is He's beginning to tie these, these two things together, this, this, this prayer movement and this missions movement. Alan Scott is, is first and foremost a guy who burns for the lost. He burns for reformation. He burns to see cities transformed. He's, he's not necessarily a renewal guy, you know? He's never really, um, he's very been impacted by that, but he's like, unless it's touching cities, unless it's reaching, unless it's transforming, the, the, the lost, he, he's like, I, my heart can't even get in it, you know? And then you got, you know, the Lord is, you know, we've been taking over the prayer piece and I, I don't think I've ever felt a greater burden in my heart than to, to ignite prayer, you know? And, and, and just creating a space where we're building an altar to the Lord, um, where we're able to minister to the Lord. And I, I think it, it's, it's these two, they're kind of incubators, you know? For, for the worship movement, and it's it's the songs that begin to flow, you know, um, um, out of this that I that I that I feel because again, uh, so the way worship songs are being written now, it, it's becoming um, it's an interesting you know thing because it's almost becoming like a professional gig, you know, and um, and I and I am deeply convinced that although God can move through anything, you know, He can He can He can take songs that have been written out of all the wrong motives and use them for His glory. It's it's remarkable what the Lord does. But I, at the same time, I, I really do feel that the Lord is is releasing and igniting houses of prayer, houses of mission, and and it's igniting a generation that's not going to be caught in the seduction of fame or platform or celebrity, but who are laying their lives down. Um, to see heaven come to earth, to see the lost come to know Jesus. And it's these little movements, these little boiler rooms all of the earth that I, be, I think are going to come, the fresh new greenhouses that are going to release the anthems, the ones that are coming out of full sacrificial love and devotion to Jesus. Um, it's just, I, I feel like there's going to be these things popping up all over the place. And, um, and I think there's something the Lord wants to do at Anaheim that has to do with that, you know? Um, and... Uh, Anyway, that's, a, that's not even really an answer to your question. That's a big ramble <laughs> on a lot of different fronts. But um, yeah, I think for me, it's, it's, it's like when we came to Anaheim, we know that expressions and songs, songs are the ultimate fruit that we're going to be able to pick off the tree. But I think we're cultivating the soil. We're, we're creating a, a thing for the roots, for, for, the, for the tree to grow. And once, once that tree comes into you know, into maturity, it, it will produce fruit effortlessly. Like not only the thing, I think right now our season, it's, it's not trying to create fruit out of thin air. I think it's tending to the garden. It's, it's cultivating the soil. It's weeding out the things that, that have kind of choked out, you know, the thing that, that God, wants to, God wants to do. <clears throat> it's a lot of groundwork right now to create a culture, you know, again, that's vibrant, open to the Holy Spirit. And, um, Anyway, Randy, I, I could just, <laughs> you're tapping into like, uh, anyway, just, just focus me, please, Randy, focus me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have a qu- uh, My daughter told me, she's, uh, I think, 32 now, and she told me when she was 13, hmm. Daddy. I'm going to marry me a worship leader. <laughs> and then at around 15 years old, her eyes were, we had moved from St. Louis to uh, Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Wow. And uh, her eyes were open to see a young 15 year old that she'd known for a couple of years. Wow. And it's like, God said, that's, that's, that's going to be your husband. Wow. And he, he, it was a young worship leader. And now he's uh, like they're the same age and um, churches a few thousand people. And wow. he's one of the main worship, worship leaders, got more, a lot of responsibility for working with so the teams. Good, and, so good. And my daughter told me uh, one time uh, 
we actually had a big meeting somewhere and we had a, a, a group come in and, and she just felt like it didn't fit. Hmm. And she said, Dad, do not sell out worship wow. for a crowd. And she was very serious. <laughs> and it was something. <laughs> no, she, she caught it. Yeah. Yeah, she caught it. Now she and her husband, they love the presence. They love worship. And uh, they're, you know, <laughs> developing a label and things like that and, and trying to do it in a way that's just honoring you know? Yeah, to the Lord. But it's, it's a... And, it, and God's really working in their lives. So, and they really, really respect you. Hmm. And, and I was wondering if there's something you could say to them as they're trying to create Atmosphere. What is there anything you would say to them that would be a priority that might help them as they're trying to, as young as they are? And... Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> Just stay the course. Don't ever lose the heart. Like, don't follow the road most traveled. Like, you, you, you don't need to. Um, yeah. Stay close to the heart of the Lord. Keep in mind what, what the heart of worship really is. I, I just think there's so much, so much distraction, so much pressure, so much um, stuff that is, that is as weighing leaders down as to what worship is. It's just, and I, I see worship leaders all over. They're just burdened with so many other agendas and things. They're trying to be powerful and they're trying to sing songs of breakthrough or just, all these things, you, you know. And I, I go, just love Jesus. Love him so well. Adore him so well. Like, you don't need to kill the worship leader game. You don't need to kill the song game or the lead. Like, if you love Jesus, if you make him your most precious and, tr and treasured possession, if you, if you, if you honor his presence and his activity in your midst, even if it costs you, you will be rewarded greatly with, with the most precious treasure that we have. It is, it is His presence. If you honor that, it, you know, in your midst, and you don't, yeah, get sidetracked with anything else, I, I think you will create a well for nations to drink from. I don't think we understand what, what's at stake. I, you know, sometimes if we can just guard the heart. Bethel, all these worship movements, they were never the best, most qualified, competent, organized. They were often the least. They were just the ones who, who protected the heart, who guarded the heart. And um, I, I'm just, I, there's nothing, it's just not complicated. I just want to encourage people. But I think in order to do that, it's 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 about the whole of your life and and the and how you how how you architect and again we have to keep worship it's never meant to be an isolated thing like and I'm, you know if there's one thing that i feel the lord has preserved my life with is he's never let me specialize in music he's never let me just be that the one thing uh, you know, and he's always, you know, there was a six year season where he's like, you need to go past your junior hires. He's like, and, and I think that made me uh, like, it's, it's, it's hard to put a number to that, but three times the worship leader that I was just like, I had to lay down music to learn how to care for a junior high, how to care for their soul, like how to, uh, you know, and I was like, oh Lord, I caught a vision for your church. I, I've caught a vision for what you want to do with your people. I think prayer, ministry to the Lord. Like we have to, we have to create spaces that aren't pressurized, like Sunday mornings are pressurized, where our leaders and our people can just be face to face with the Lord, you know, and learn how to be in that place of intimacy um, with the Lord. It has to be coupled with mission and compassion. Like it, it, it just has to. I don't know of anything that'll purify someone's life quicker than interacting and being amongst the poor. And like, if, if, if we're going to navigate these realms where the seduction 
like is so fierce, like over worship leaders' lives and the pressure and, and all these things that can make our souls sick. If we get around the least and if, if we follow Jesus, not just as, as a chief worshiper, but as someone who's in the fields and in the harvest, who's got a towel around his waist, like if we follow his lead, if we follow his example, like we won't lose the heart of worship. Like he, that will purify us as we follow him. And, and like, it's about Jesus. It's the glorifying him, but following him, taking him, but like following his, his example. And as we, as, we, as we do that, as we make sure that we're not creating our lives that are too insulated, you know, from, from the ministry that, that he gave himself to, we will protect and safeguard our legacy, our destiny, the thing that we're supposed to be stepping into. So I just don't let anything or anyone pull you from walking and being Jesus, like glorifying Him. And it may not make sense. There, there may be a pruning before there's a fruit bearing. And I think that like, honestly, the worship movement is, is going to be pruned. It's going to be corrected. Like um, the Lord won't allow it to continue to, 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 to grow in all the ways that it's growing. I, I think a pruning is coming. I am in a season of pruning. You know, the Lord, I think coming back to Anaheim was a season of pruning. And it's always unto more fruit, like always. But first, there's that pruning. There's beautiful things that were grown. It bore a lot of fruit. And now I'm in a season of like coming back again to the heart, like purify me. We used to sing that song in the vineyard, refiner's fire. My heart's one desire is to be holy, set apart for you, my master. And I think we need to think generationally. We need to think about the generation to come. The ones who, who, are, who are not going to look at all our performances and our awards and our all that you know, stuff, but if like, like where's the legacy of purity and passion um, you know, you know, before the Lord? Think about a generation that's just longing to see an example. They may not, ha- but, but when we lead with that example, we will awaken a whole generation to come and to, to let no one rob us from from creating a space for them where where uh where they can become the full stature of men and women priests and kings and queens on the earth given over to the lord like anyway um that's a that's a that's a lot to say but ultimately at the end of the day it's never stop following the model of jesus like we we never are ever we don't ever outgrow that you know, the model of Jesus, let zeal for the house of the Lord. My house will be a house of prayer. It'll be a house of connection for all nations. Like, yeah, like let zeal for the Lord. Let his zeal overtake us. Anyway, there's a lot there. <laughs> uh, this is awesome. I, I'm very much feeling the presence of God. <laughs> she... Yes. Um. Uh. And Randy, like fathers, like I don't know how many times I've sat and listened to you, and my heart is like, like it realigns. Like we need fathers to speak in this area of worship. I think people are sometimes afraid to speak into it because it's new, it's uncharted, and there's all this stuff. But but fathers and mothers who remember. You know, remember that, that, that heart, remember those days, you know. There's so many young people that are so confused, you know, right now, and, and they're trying to navigate this the best that they know how. They just need, like, someone who remembers. You know, we just had Bob and Penny Fulton come up and just talk about what God did and, and talk about how Sovereign and, and Lonnie Frisbee and just everything that began to happen talked about Toronto. We spent a long time talking about Toronto and just kind of revisiting these moves of God. And there's just something in it when mothers and fathers who were there in those moments remember just even what it felt like and what it was characterized like. It's nourishment for our hearts. Like it, it's course correction, you know, when, 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 when we can be pulled by so many things, you know. And so I'm just so grateful. Don't ever start talking. Don't ever stop talking about worship and like there is so much that um, mothers and fathers, oh, I so need them. I so need them. I'm just so grateful for your life, and it's why I keep showing up at these. You know, like it's literally just to be around you, and and um, around the environments that you create, because um, it's 
it's just massive. It's so important. So it's an honor that you keep inviting me. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I'm glad you come. Yeah. Love what you offer and what God's doing <laughs> in you, through you. Oof. Uh, what, Jeremy, I, I have a question like, what if someone's watching this and they're not from the charismatic <laughs> movement or a third wave evangelical <laughs> movement or a Pentecostal movement? And they're, they may be watching it and they're American Baptist, Southern Baptist, <laughs> Presbyterian, Lutheran, Methodist, and and maybe they're even the uh, volunteer worship leader mm -hmm. and they would like to just know, what could I do to see mm -hmm. God show up in our church, in our, His presence in our worship? Is there anything you could share to someone like that who has n maybe never been in an environment yeah. or an atmosphere to experience what we're talking yeah. about? Yeah. Um, yeah, to me, I think the journey that I'm I'm still on, and I, I feel still so new to, but I would say if there's one thing that has changed my life, my ministry, um, given me wisdom, wisdom and keys for any church circle, I haven't just led in charismatic churches, you know, like I've, I've led in very, very conservative ones. And what I realize is that it doesn't matter what's circular in. Everyone's hungry for God. Everyone's hunger, hungry for, for a taste of His presence and, and to encounter Him. Like there's, there's no, I think sometimes we, we, we keep certain things closed off because our language is so different. But the truth is everybody wants what's real, wants what's authentic. And I think the thing that I have given myself over to is um, understanding and growing my relationship with the Holy Spirit. Like understanding that, and, and that is universal. The Holy Spirit is for the whole church. He's not just for the charismatic ones or for the crazy ones. The Holy Spirit is a gift and a seal, and He is the orchestrator and leader of the church. And, and, and it's not like He's very practical. Like He's, he's not like, you know, he, he will ask you to do some things that might baffle your understanding, but it's always amazing to me how practical the Holy Spirit is too. And, um, and it is, I've just learned to, to press in, to seek relationship, like to just build. I mean, and it's clumsy when you're trying to build a relationship with, you know, with the Lord. Like, Holy Spirit, I don't even know how to pray. I, 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 don't, I don't know how to lead. I'm just hungry to build a relationship with you because if I can hear you, if I can discern what you're saying, I, I've tasted those moments where everything has changed. Um, not because of my brilliant strategy or my incredible set preparation or any of those things, just because in a moment, one little moment where I followed the prompting of the Holy Spirit and I watched breakthrough happen. And I've learned that what, what, what every church circle, what every um, stream of church is needing is, is, is not more brilliant strategy and gifted, uh, not well gifted, yes, leaders and all of that, but it needs people who are full of the Holy Spirit. And and who, who are given over to following the Holy Spirit. And because the Holy Spirit will give you keys for your church in its context, like where it's at, in its journey. And, um, and I've had moments where just small little promptings, like I don't, you don't, you don't have, you can give me a highly, I, I've had to minister environments where it's, you get 15 minutes. Like, you know, it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't, I don't go, oh, well, that's three songs and on, well, I'm on autopilot. Like, no, like following the Holy Spirit is, is, is a day in, day out thing. So in that moment, I'll put together songs and I'll ask the Holy Spirit. I just, it's a relationship. I'm like, Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do here? How should I navigate? I always leave a little bit of space, no matter what, in a worship set of just going like, Holy Spirit, is there anything you want to say? Is there any little impression? You know, and it's, and, and just being faithful to do it. Like in, in a, just, if you feel it, take a risk, like in your context, you don't like, like we're all intimidated because we're like, well, if we're going to do spontaneous, or we're going to move in the prophetic, it has to look like this. Like forget all the models, just be faithful to follow the little promptings of the Holy Spirit. Even if it's just, oh, I feel this little extra chorus bubbling up. I'm just going to sing that. You don't have to make it a huge moment. You don't have to drag your whole band into it. Just be a little moment. Just learn to take your people on a journey. 
with, within the parameters and the boundaries that, that you've been given. Because again, we're, we're servants. We, we, don't, we don't always set the, the parameters of, of where we're at. We're just servants. But within those parameters, we're called to be a spirit-filled, a spirit-led people always and ever. And, and um, give yourself over. Invite, commune with the Holy Spirit. We, we have different languages coasting His presence. But a good host is just most and foremost, they're just attentive. They're, they're, they just pay attention. They, they realize the Holy Spirit is you know, in them and upon them for the task of ministry, and they're attentive to that. And they realize that He's speaking, and all they need to do is tune their ears to how He's speaking. Go on that journey. Discover. You gotta take some risk. Risk is a part of it. You gotta. Um, you're gonna jump off some cliffs. It may not always go well. Don't be discouraged in that journey. You follow the Holy Spirit, you will see breakthrough. You will see him come, and you will see him rewrite the story of your life and your church, and um, just with a simple yes. So that'd be my encouragement. Well, I'd like to end by asking you uh, kind of another uh, strategy or another uh, <laughs> approach. Could you give me what you think would be maybe five of the most um, dangerous roadblocks or potholes or detours uh, that that a worship leader has to watch out for. Hmm. Hmm. That could, you know, I guess it's the other, what, what are some Ooh. things that could take us, take the worship leader the wrong way or yeah. some of the, some of the challenges that they sometimes can face? Yeah. Again, I don't know if I could, I can talk about five pitfalls, but I can definitely talk about um, two to watch out, you know, watch out for. I think um, one of the things that um, is needed um, for any spiritual leader, any leader that's going to, to, to um, move in the house of God in any kind of authority, there's, there's a real surrender that has to take place, um, a real death. That, that has to take place. You know, that, that old quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, when Christ calls a man, he bids him um, to come and die. And I, I think the journey that the Lord has taken me on, you know, people, people see my, my life now and they don't understand the context and the five-year wrestle that I had with the Lord um, where, where I chased significance. I had a humongous appetite. I had a drive for significance. I'm like, I, I just, I, I can't do the mortgage and the minivan and the nine to five. I'm like, spare me that. Like, I have to do something that leaves a mark on the earth. And, but it was so clouded with selfish ambition and, and need, you know, it was very orphaned. Um, it wasn't connected to the fullness of the Lord or, or my identity as a son of God. It was connected with a need to prove myself and, and establish myself and all these, you know, you know, things and, and a desire for fame, a real desire for, for personal glory, you know. And, um, and so I, I pursued it. I chased it. I gave myself to it. And, and the Lord just brought me to a place of total brokenness before him brought me to a place and it was a real death it wasn't just a one time altar call it was a, it was a real death it was one of the most costly things where i just kind of gave up and i said okay lord you do whatever you want to do with my life i'm tired of fighting i'm trying tired of trying to make my own way and and I would love to tell you that I was met with, you know, this amazing euphoric, you know, crazy experience, but it was a miserable season of, of real surrender. And, but I began to experience the peace of the Lord. And I began to experience, um, I began to pray. Like I, I began, once I felt the peace, I tasted the peace. I'm like, oh, this is good. And I began to pray, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm in it. I'm in it now. Like whatever you want to do with my life, you do it. Away from music, like I surrendered all my dreams. My dreams and my passions were the hardest things for me to surrender. But I even laid those down. And I said, okay, if it's not music, if it's this, whatever it is, if it's not business, you know, whatever it is. And, and, um, and I gave it all up. And I, and I feel like, guys, leaders in the church, you have to lay it all down. Like, you have to lay it all down um, um, to see a real resurrection. Because the thing is, is the enemy, his, his only power for seduction is the parts of your flesh that are still alive. 
Like, you know, and, and, and if you have literally buried those and you've sunk them down in, 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 in the tank, like he can, he can poke, he can, he can maybe try and awaken the old man, but he will ultimately not be successful if it's a, if it's a real death. It'd be like, no, I'm alive for the glory of God. Like you can't, there's no foothold left for you to try and, 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 um, and try and weasel your way or try and influence me in any, any way. And I just think, we got to lay it all down. We, you know, whether, whether our lives of serving Jesus lead us, you know, from our idea of glory to glory or whether they lead us to, to the, you know, the huts of Calcutta or whatever, wherever it leads us. We just, we're like, we're, we're Jesus people. Like we surrender our influence, our legacy, the scope of it all. We have to surrender that completely to the Lord. And as we do that, we leave no place for the enemy to try and manipulate our flesh or whatever lingering selfish ambition we have, because I tell you what, as that may not be tested at the local church level, but as the Lord grows your life and, and, and you find more and more favor and influence, that will be tested. And that, I would love to say that journey of surrender was only a one-time journey. It's not been a one-time journey for me. That's been a journey I've had to revisit over and over of like, all right, Lord, I surrender again. Like, like I surrender again. And, um, and so I think like that's massive, like, we, 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 we are, we, our lives must be on the altar. Like at all times, we are living sacrifices to the Lord if we really want to see fire fall. Um, and I, I, I feel like we have a th- some theologies now. My concern about some of our theologies, even when it comes to societal or cultural transformation of love, infiltrating the seven mountains and realms of society, I think my only concern with that is if we have unsurrendered lives to Jesus, we can take that theology and kind of justify a little bit of selfish ambition. We're like, oh, I, I was born to be a rock star, and so I must infiltrate the rat realm of society. And really, it's, it's, not, it's not a Jesus mission. It's still a personal mission where we're just after the same things that the world is after, and we're hungry for the same things that the world's after. And um, so we have to guard that and guard that journey. Um, because we do need, we are called to influence, like, you know, the world, but as a surrendered, laid down lover of Jesus Christ. <laughs> and so, um, I'd say surrender, um, being one. I'd say cultivate, keep first love, you know, alive and, um, and, and vibrant to the Lord. And remember, you, you, you know, your, your place of servant, you know, your place of service. It's so fascinating that the number one question that the Lord asks us, you know, and, you know, that whole dialogue between Peter is just like, Peter, do you love me? Like, do you love me? And I, I think that that first love thing is something that we have to guard. This can become a skill set. This can become something that we become very, very good at. Um, Sometimes I wonder, you know, we talk about song leadership versus worship leadership. That'd be an amazing thing to unpack at some point because you can string the right songs together. You, like there is a form that is powerful and, and, and we can just become people who learn how to execute a form. But I think we are called to be lovers of, of Jesus and to cultivate and guard our first love. That is the wellspring with which, with everything else flows from. And I, I found that that's the thing that I have to, that I have to fight for. I have to fight to keep that love burning and vibrant. And, and I have to follow the Holy Spirit and how He directs me to keep that love burning and vibrant. Um, cause it's not just one thing. I think the way that I have kept that love burning vibrant is, is to maintain the heart of a shepherd. Like, like to don't, don't, if this, if this thing, if we don't ever get, your, let your life be so insulated where it's not about touching and ministering to real people, laying down your life for real people, shepherding real people. Um, I, I think it's massive. We can create insulated lives within the realm of worship and it's easy to do, particularly as the celebrity of it grows. Um, it gets weirder the more access you have for people, but we can't be too insulated from people and from the heart of a shepherd and learning how to love them and care for them and nurture them. And these two things will protect your heart. Like you keep first love, like you feed your, your focus is, I, Jesus, I love you and I'm gonna feed your sheep. And, um, and I'm going to continue to live a life of surrender to him. And I could probably keep prattling on and try and five, but those are the two that I think have really, really protected my, you know, my life, you know? So, um, thank you. Wish I could, I'm going to write that down though <laughs> and probably write, you know, a book about it at some day. <laughs> five things to avoid as pitfalls. Holy smokes. Yeah.
Thank you, Jeremy.